Hi everyone and welcome to this video in the tort series Liability and Negligence for Injury to People and Damage to Property and today we're looking at Breach of Duty Causes Damage. So what I'd like you to do, I'm assuming that you've watched the previous videos on duty of care and breach of duty of care. If you haven't, this video will make no sense and will confuse you no end. So you need to stop here and go back and watch those ones first. Assuming that you've already done that, what I'd like you to do on a piece of paper, I'd like you to write down everything you can remember about the law of negligence thus far. Categorizing things under the headings of duty of care and breach of duty of care. So pause the video here, give yourself five minutes just to have a look at what you've done and then meet me back here in a moment once you've done that. So I'm assuming you've done that and on duty of care you have something that looks something like this. Uh, we're starting at the top with Donahue and Stevenson with the neighbour principle and then moving down into the Caparo test, establishing whether a duty of care is owed, looking at was the harm reasonably foreseeable, supported by Kent and Griffiths, is the sufficient proximity between the claimant and the defendant in time, space and relationship, supported by Home Office and Dorset Yacht Club? And is it fair, just and reasonable to impose a duty? This is if your defendant was a rescuer emergency service, as supported by Hill and the Chief Constable of Yorkshire Police. So something that looks something like this, or you can do it in your own way. On breach of duty, there's more detail here. The first part that you needed to talk about was once you've established that a duty of care is owed using the previous one, what is the standard of that duty expected? Are you looking at a normal person going about their normal everyday business using the reasonable man test from Blythe and Birmingham Waterworks? Is your defendant a learner, as in Nettleship and Western? Or is your defendant a professional exercising that particular skill, as in Bolham and Freehan Hospital? And to see if the duty has been breached, the court looks at the risk factors, how likely is the harm, the practicality of taking precautions, how serious the harm could be, and is the defendant's activity socially important? So hopefully you've got the notes on duty of care and the notes on breach of duty. If you're unsure, now is the point to go back. You don't want to add anything more on if you haven't got the first bit first. So I'm assuming that you're all with me thus far. So remembering that the tort of negligence, you're looking at three stages that have to be proven in this order. So first of all was duty of care. Then you have to establish that that duty of care has been breached. And now we come on to what we're looking at today, which is breach of duty causing damage. So what I'd like you to do for me is, is take a moment and think about the word foreseeability. Try and work out what that word might mean. So if you split the word up, you've, you've got two bits, haven't you? You've got the foresee part and the ability part, the ability to foresee, if you will. So definitions that you could have is something like to see beforehand, to guess the outcome or to have an idea of the outcome. Every day when we go out, we know that there are various things that could happen. You are on your way to college and you need to go and catch the bus and you have to cross a road in order to get there. You know that there are a variety of unpleasant possibilities that could arise when you leave the house and when you cross the road. You know in your own mind that actually the likelihood of that happening is quite low, but it is still possible. There's a variety of possibilities. You might make it to college, absolutely fine. You might make it to college because you're a bit late. You might not make it to college. But you don't know what's going to happen until you've actually got there. But you know that those things might happen. And we look at the phrase reasonably foreseeable. We also know that on our walk to college, there is a possibility, however remote, that you may not get there because you have been abducted by aliens. It's a possibility, but it's not very likely. So things which are reasonably foreseeable are possibilities with some degree of likelihood to occur rather than you're really far out things like 
being abducted by aliens. So what I would like you to do, like we've done before, I would like you to, on your notepaper, take down a copy of something that looks like this, split into the four sections. You can lay this out however you want, but whatever you do, make sure that you leave some little space around so that you can make notes as you go along. Pause the video here, copy that down, and I'll meet you back here in a sec. So let's get cracking with the, the first section. So let's look at the, the term causation. This is going to be a term that you come back to quite often because it's going to appear in criminal law as well. What we're looking at is, did the defendant's actions cause the outcome? That is what the term causation means. And it's quite often known as a causal link or a chain of causation. So usually the question of causation is quite straightforward in that you can see that a particular injury or damage arose from the defendant's action. However, sometimes if causation is in doubt, if it's not absolutely clear that your defendant caused the harm to the victim, we use what's known as the but-for test. Uh, the but-for test is also known as causation in fact. So causation, in fact, uses the but-for test. And this is seen in the case of Barnett and Chelsea and Kensington Hospital. So using the but-for test, you can sometimes swap the phrase but-for for the slightly clunky phrase, if it were not for. So we're saying, if it were not for the defendant doing X, the harm would not have happened to the claimant Y. So this is an example where the but for test fails. In Barnet and Chelsea and Kensington Hospital, the victim, the claimants, died from arsenic poisoning. The claimant's widow claimed compensation from the hospital because the hospital failed to examine him and didn't diagnose the poisoning. And the victim died from the poisoning. And the court held that whether or not the hospital had examined this poor man wouldn't have made any difference. He still would have died. So if it were not for the hospital not examining the poor man who was poisoned, he still would have died. So there is no chain of causation between the poor man's death and the hospital not examining him. So the hospital didn't cause his death, is what we're saying. It would be worth having a practice using this but-for test for some examples. So if, for example, um, I step out into the road and I am hit by a car, uh, but for the, and I am killed as a result, but for the car hitting me, I would not have died. Okay? So... It becomes a little more complicated where there isn't one cause, if there are multiple causes. And this is illustrated in the case of Fairchild and Glenhaven Funeral Services Limited. In this case, the worker contracted a form of cancer. It's known as mesenthelioma due to his exposure to asbestos. The exposure could have come from several different employers, but they couldn't identify exactly which one had caused the cancer. And the court held that the claimant must prove the defendant's breach caused the harm or was a material contribution. Also, we have to have a look at successive causes, so one thing and then another thing. Um, and this is discussed in the case of Performance Cars and Abraham. And the court held that where there are two successive causes of harm, the court may regard the first event as the cause of the harm so the originating event. We also have to have a look at causation in law and have a look at what if something comes along and stops the first event being the cause of the harm. And this is in Latin known as the novus actus interveniens. Again, a concept that will come up a few times when you're studying law. And this translates to an intervening act or an intervening event. And if you have an intervening event, this can break the chain of causation. 
So at the bottom I've given you a scenario where you can see this novus actus interveniens, an intervening act breaking the chain. So you have your claimant who suffers a broken wrist in a car accident, which is caused by the negligent driving of the other driver. And the claimant is sent to hospital in an ambulance with a broken wrist. On the way to hospital, the ambulance is hit by lightning and the claimant dies from the, the burns. Now, the broken wrist is clearly the responsibility of the negligent driver, but the death from the burns is not, and that would break the chain of causation because you've got your intervening act, the ambulance being hit by lightning. We also have to have a look at this remoteness, this foreseeability of the damage. And this is seen in the case of Wagon Mound. And this goes back to what we were looking at before. Is it foreseeable? Could you guess what was going to happen? In this case, the defendant was loading a ship in Sydney Harbour and they negligently spilt oil whilst loading the ship. A few days later, the claimant was welding nearby and sparks touched the spilt oil that the defendant had spilt. A fire started and it damaged property. Now the question was, was the fire foreseeable? And the court held that the damage to all the property couldn't be foreseen as it was too remote. If you spilt oil, it was foreseeable that possibly the oil would get onto the other boats and it would have to be cleaned off and that would be, that damage was foreseeable. But the oil spreading, sparks touching it, it causing a fire and that causing damaged property, that was too remote. That wasn't foreseeable. You couldn't have guessed that that would happen. So you have to be able to guess what things could happen, but you don't have to foresee the exact injury, just the type of injury. And this is seen in the case of Hughes and Lord Advocate. In this case, a post office worker put a paraffin lamp around a tent covering a manhole. A 10 year old boy picked up the lamp and went into the tent, tripped over, there was a huge explosion, he fell down the hole and he was severely burnt. The House of Lords said that the burns were reasonably foreseeable and it didn't matter whether the precise manner of the injury was exactly known. If you mix a 10 year old boy with a paraffin lamp, a deep hole in a tent, you know somebody's going to get burnt. Even if you don't know that it's the little boy, even if you don't know he's going to fall down the hole, even if you don't know that there's going to be an explosion, it's obvious somebody's going to get burnt. And this is also seen in the case of Bradford and Robinson Rentals. In this case, uh, the claimant's employer asked him to take an old van from Exeter to Bedford in order to swap it for a new one. The weather was very cold and the weatherman gave the advice to travel only when necessary. In the van that he was taking back, there was no heater and he had to travel with the window open and he kept on having to stop to top up the leaking radiator and the claimant suffered frostbite as a result. And the defendant was held liable for this because it was foreseeable that the claimant would suffer some sort of cold related injury even if you didn't predict exactly what cold related injury it would be. And finally we have to have a look at the thin skull rule. You have to take your victim as you find them. So even if your victim is particularly vulnerable for some reason, you are still responsible for the full range of injury or damage which they sustain. Even if a, and I'm using air quotes here people, normal person without that particular vulnerability, whatever it might be, would not have suffered the damage, you are still responsible for the full range of damage. And in the case of Smith and Leech Brain, the man was scalded on the lip with molten metal, which splashed him due to the employer's negligence. Now, anybody else would have just suffered a particularly unpleasant burn, which would have gone away sooner rather than later. However, this particular claimant had a dormant type of cancer, which was triggered, and he died as a result. And in this case, it was held that the burn was foreseeable, even if the death wasn't. 
And because you have to take your victim as you find them, and you're responsible for the full range of damage that they suffer, the defendant was still liable for the, the full extent of injuries to the claimant. So now hopefully you should be able to take the notes that you've got and use them to explain the meaning of the term breach of duty causes damage. Before you attempt the question, I would suggest that you pause, go back and rewrite your notes so that they're nice and neat and then attempt this six mark question. So what you've got, what you are left with is we first of all looked at duty of care then we looked at breach of duty, then we looked at the damage caused by that breach of duty, and what you end up with is liability in negligence. Next stop is going to be looking at damages, so looking at what you might get if you successfully claim in the tort of negligence. So thanks for listening. If you've got any questions, please let me know.